Just first, um, can you just give us your reaction to the stabbings that we've seen uh, in Reading, of course, the fast-moving police investigation? Um, good morning to you and your guests. I mean, it, I was quite shocked to read these things, and I think, I think what it reminds us is, although corona is dominating the press, you know, life still goes on. I know that the police are investigating this, and I'm, we just need to wait to come back to see if they say if it's terror or, unfortunately, a murder. Let's see what, what's gone on. Uh, you mentioned uh, coronavirus there, and I do want to ask you a little bit about the rate of coronavirus infections in London, because if you look at the latest uh, figures that were published uh, this week on Friday, they estimated the growth rate of infection uh, to be between minus five and plus one. So unlike anywhere else in the UK, there is a chance that it, coronavirus infections are actually on the up in London. How worried are you about that? Of course, like everyone, I'm very worried by that. But in London, we have a very unique situation in that there's nine million people in one place and we all travel around so far to work. And of course, we have a great big cadre of, of emergency workers as well. So we have a lot of contact that maybe slightly smaller cities in the country wouldn't have. But I do see in London that people have taken social distancing very seriously, definitely. You say that people are taking social distancing seriously in London, but at the same time, if you, you know, go around London now, you can see an awful lot of people out and about, perhaps not always uh, obeying uh, the social distancing rules in the way that they should have, standing outside pubs, congregating in parks. Are you worried that actually, in some, for some people, it feels like lockdown is over in London? I think there's two things I'd say. Firstly, on the whole, we have taken it very, very seriously. Remember, there's nine million people in London. And I was queuing outside of our of our supermarket, which is adjacent to the train station, and saw very, very few people in there. Ridership on the whole transport network is down very low. The other end of the argument, of course, is that a lot of people whose families and personal lives haven't been affected by, affected by coronavirus are beginning to feel like they can start to move around. And we're at that very strange tipping point where we do want to get our economy back, back up and running. So we're asking people to move around safely. And I think some of that is what you're observing. Um, do you think we could see a spike in cases after the Black Lives Matter protests? I think we could see a spike in cases anyway. If you look at um, pandemics historically, there's always been a second wave. I, I believe we need to prepare ourselves for a second wave, but again, we still also need to look at how do we start to get the country moving again? Because one thing we know for sure, second wave or not, our economy absolutely needs to start moving. Um, as, as the economy starts to uh, get moving again, as you say, more people going to work, uh, spending money uh, in businesses that really need it, transport is going to be uh, absolutely key uh, as well. Um, now, we've been told not to use public transport where we can, but at the same time, the congestion charge uh, has actually gone up in London at a time when many people uh, are using their cars to try and say, stay safe. Is that right? I, I actually don't think it's right, and for, for two main reasons. One, there's a mixed message there. You're saying to people, stay off public transport, but you're also saying to people they can't use their car. And why that's um, important in London, car use will only be temporary, but London is enormous, and some people don't have a choice. They can't walk or cycle somewhere, and they need to use that car. And secondly, because the price has been bumped and the scope has been widened, so it now runs late into the evening and on Saturday and Sundays, it's affecting people who are trying to run small businesses, people are trying to move around to get their communities going if they're religious, etc. And I think it's actually really quite devastating to London life, making a step back to normality. Because really, it's the government that's to blame for that, isn't it? Um, the, I'm just looking at the wording of the bailout deal that uh, the London Mayor Sadiq Khan had to sign up to in order to get more money for uh, Transport for London. The funding package is conditional on the agreement from Transport for London that it will agree to the conditions below, the immediate reintroduction of the London congestion charge and the ultra low emission zone, and urgently bring forward proposals to widen the scope and level of these charges. So have you brought this up with Boris Johnson? I brought it up with Boris and the mayor, and what you find is the mayor never gave any suggestions. He just marched ahead and widened the scope and increased the price. So and what did Boris Johnson say when you brought it up with him? He said, well, that's a decision the mayor's made and we're, and we're going to have to go with it. The, the mayor is the mayor of London. He's well, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't sound like a decision that the, the mayor's made if the wording of the bailout deal is that it's all the money is conditional on the fact that he'll... No. But the money was conditional. The money was conditional on reintroducing reintroducing the congestion charge. That's correct, and it was always a temporary ban that I was and a person. Urgently bring forward proposals to widen the scope that, and level that, of these charges that, as well. 
But Sophie, that's the point. He never brought put forward proposals. He just in state, he just he just put them on top. He just said, right, it's going to be more money, and we're going to run for a longer period of time for a week. Never asked. He never debated with anyone. And that's the point, isn't it? Londoners are not stupid. We understand that the economy is taking a hit. We understand that TfL needs support. But what we do need is a mayor who deals straight with the government so we can get the maximum help. Going forward, London's situation is going to be tricky. But if we have a mayor who issues fait to complete and has turned this into a political fight with the government, Londoners will not get the best deal. That's why that small but very important detail needs to be focused on. Uh, I'm keen to talk to you a bit about Black Lives Matter. We've seen thousands of people taking to the streets to demand uh, equality. Now, Dominic Raab was asked about taking the knee. Uh, he said he would only take the knee for the Queen and the Missus when I asked her to marry me. And he went on to say, maybe it's got a broader history, but it seems to be taken from the Game of Thrones. It feels to me like a symbol of subjugation and subordination rather than one of liberation and emancipation. Were you offended by what Dominic Raab said? No, because I think taking the knee is a very personal, um, a very personal gesture, and you have to understand what it means for you. You saw some police officers do it, some not doing it. You see some people do it, not do it. The thing about taking the knee, it means nothing if you're bullied into taking the knee. It means nothing if your boss sends you an email saying you have to do it. You do it because you want to do it, and you want to show you, you, you want to display what you believe that means. Dominic Raab is in a very um, privileged position where he could do many, many other far more meaningful things to support the cause of, 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 you know, of equality for black people. But you don't think it's a Game of Thrones symbol? <laughs> what, I, what I think it is, it's a, it's a symbol, isn't it? It's definitely symbolic. And some people say, OK, where did it come from? What, what does it mean? But I'm very clear. If you want to take the knee or not is, is one thing. But what's much more important is what you do in your personal life. I think where people have missed something here, we've talked about legislation, we've talked about the government, but most of this is hearts and minds. And people have to remember, we need to do this together. We need to go together. And I'm beginning to worry that people are turning into political football to suggest that they're more interested in the, in the, in the future of black people than anybody else for political gain, gain. So I think people being truthful about how they feel and what they're going to do is very, very important. Now, you would be the first black mayor of London if you uh, get the job. But in a week where thousands of people went on the Black Lives Matter protests, there were reports that people from within your own party were trying to deselect you. Was that true? <laughs> Actually, I've kind of dug around to the bottom of this. What was really good about this is was when this rumour uh, emerged, I went straight to, to the PM and I said, what's going on here? And he said, whatever it is, Sean, you need to worry because I'm on your side. Let's do some investigation. Certain people have got big mouths and certain people were always distressed that I was selected as the candidate to run for the Conservative Party. But one of my proudest boasts is that I was selected by the members. The members had a choice and they chose me. And they've shown with this rumour who they support and who they don't support, because they all rallied behind me. And the most important thing is, the man that they suggested wanted to do the job, Saj, he rang me straight away and he said, Sean, this is nonsense. I look forward to coming out and campaigning with you. So what I've done is just taken solace from the fact that I have more support now than I've ever had before. So I'm just going to get on with campaigning. You said there about some people with big mouths who've always had a problem with your candidacy. Yeah. Why do you think they always have had a problem with your candidacy? Look, anybody who knows anything about me knows I'm not your typical politician. I, I was a youth worker for 20 years, London of born and bred. I've been homeless. I've been raised by my single mother in a council flat. For some people, this has always been a problem. But, but for the Conservative Party as it stands in London, that means they know the issues that London faces. Why, why has it been a problem? Because because they, 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 they've said it, they've, they've, they've set up opposition to me. But what it's done, actually, is given me an opportunity to talk about why I'm relevant to Londoners here in 2020. But you'll always find it in politics. I mean, your, your journey, Sophie, how much rumour, conjecture, nonsense have you come across in your professional career around politics? It, it, unfortunately, it's the way it goes. But I, I, I relish it. You, 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 you put your head above the parapet, you prepare yourself for this kind of attack.